Good evening. Sorry for the delay. Um, welcome to the inaugural Alcmarath Lecture in May, of course, of that most wonderful event. I uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm your chair for the evening. I'm Victoria MacDonald, and I'm the health and social care correspondent for Channel News. Um, I was going to say, I always get a bit nervous when I have to speak to real people instead of a camera in front of me, but the light's so bright I can't see you anyway. <laughs> uh, shortly, of course, you are all here um, to, to hear our wonderful speakers, and we will be, I will be introducing shortly Sir Harold Evans uh, as the inaugural lecturer. I think there's a more elegant way of saying that, but I'll think of it by the time he gets on stage. Um, and then after that, there will be a Q&A session, so um, please do get your other the more Bruce Keogh to have an intelligent question <laughs> ready. But can I just first of all say, on a personal note, how honoured I am to be here. Um, I met Lord Morris several times over the years, um, and I was going to say we bonded, but I'm not quite sure that's the right word over um, our mutual anger at the way people with haemophilia have been treated. Um, and of course, as all of you will know, he has led him to establish the inquiry into the tainted blood scandal. And I myself have a, an aunt by marriage who, who's been affected by this, um, not a haemophiliac, but by the tainted blood, uh, and has hepatitis C. Um, and of course, the inquiry he, he set up because the government, various governments, refused to commission one. Um, and it was his determination to see justice done that kept driving that inquiry through and I just I've often imagined tried to imagine what the backroom negotiations were as he got that done but it was incredibly admirable. Of course I admired him too enormously not just for that inquiry but for all that he'd done. You may find this surprising but there are some people out there who don't like journalists. I don't think they're in the uh, but Lord Morris was always unfailingly polite when I met him, and indeed wrote me a lovely note once um, after a piece I'd done on the tent of blood to say thank you, and that's a very rare event indeed. Um, and I was going to say, I bumped, I bumped into my neighbour this morning, she's actually a consultant rheumatologist, um, so someone who has to deal with um, disability. And I mentioned what I was doing this evening, and I said to her, really the one, the one thing you have to Remember, as every time you see someone using a disability ramp or hold a rail going into a public building or see the disability news, you have to think of Alf Morris. And in fact, when I did his obituary for Channel 4 News, I went and stood on the disability ramp going into the Tate, Britain, which wouldn't have been there otherwise. And that, of course, is what tonight's event is about. It's been designed by the Disabled Living Foundation, organisers of the Alf Morris Fund for Independent Living. Uh, this is a fund that was set up, for those of you who don't know, um, at Speaker's House last May, and its purpose to honour in a very practical way, and I think there's a lot of that that's going to come through this evening, um, the enduring legacy of Lord Morris and his impact on the way disabled and older people live their lives. And it's sadly now, and I can't quite believe this, that it is now three years since he died, and it's 45 years since this chronically sick and disabled persons act became law. Um, yet here we are at a time when health and social care are, one person suggested to me to describe it as the word flux, but I, I thought I'd probably, I'd probably strong words that some people would use in this room right now. When disabled people are facing some hardships, um, and I think I know the independent living fund may perhaps crop up this evening. But there is also, as I said, a lot of positive things to be said too. So on that note, let's let's get the evening underway as quickly as possible. And I would like to introduce Chris Shaw, who is the Chief Executive of the Disabled Thank you. Welcome. I hope uh, we're in for a very good evening. I'm sure we are. First of all, DLF is of course very delighted as well as honoured to have Sir Harold Evans giving this the first ever Alf Boris lecture. Not only a lifelong friend, as I'm sure we're here, of Alf Boris, but a renowned campaigner and a foremost journalist. I'm really proud to say uh, that DLF had a true friend in Alf Boris. Because Alf was in on the ground floor at the very beginning of DLF. Um, and that's an enterprise that has gone on to reach more than a million people a year and has the potential and the very sore need 
to do so much more. At DLF, we believe that the biggest idea and the best policy in the world cannot create change alone. For change to come, and we surely need it, we need experience and experimentation, we need practice, we need learning, we need trying things out. And it's this practical hands-on in innovation and change that is at the heart of DLF's work. What we do is all about small-scale change, betterment, improvement in daily life, creating possibilities, overcoming barriers, helping to make lives better bit by bit, day by day, one by one. We're focused on, and I've got this point perhaps better than almost anybody, the importance of the everyday. Whether it's how to get a child's wheelchair adapted for their changing needs, or how an older person can be helped to remember to turn the tap off, or to how to get safely into the comfort of a warm bath after a long day, DLF's information and advice can make the impossible possible again. So, with that in mind, with the Morris family, we have created the Alf Morris Fund for Independent Living, and it will take forward just exactly this practical change. It will further Alf's legacy and DLF's work, it will raise public awareness, and it will make possible greater strides towards true independence and full participation. I hope you will know that, uh, many people at least, that late, late last year, DLF merged and joined forces with the Shore Trust, a uh, renowned and, uh, charity with a very strong reputation in this sector. And together we look forward to greater strength and increased reach across the whole panoply of our work. And you will hear a little from Ken Elisa, the Chair of Trustees of Shore Trust, a bit later this evening. But as usual, uh, I think probably Alf said it best. Uh, he described our work as his priority of priorities, and as there being no worthier cause, nor one that makes such a tangible difference to so many lives. We will continue to do our best to live up to that endorsement. And now it's time for the lecture, and on to, Vic uh, on to Harry and on to Victoria. Thank you very much. terrifies me and it probably terrifies you too for the length of time it might take to deliver a lecture so just think of it as a talk. Um, speaking on behalf of the Alf Morris Fund for Independent Living supported by the Disabled Living Foundation which has recently joined forces with the Shore Trust which does fantastic work 
helping 50,000 people a year adjust to life, getting jobs, and so on. It's quite a toy for that is. But wherever you look, wherever you look, in the history and literature of disablement, there's Alf. Alfred Morris, the honourable member for Withenshaw, when I was a reporter, I was following him and writing notes about what he was saying, causing trouble for the Tories, he always was, uh, in a kindly way. You know, he was never very vicious. I wish he'd been more vicious sometimes. It would have made more news. Um, and and then, then one of the drafters of the United Nations Programme for Action aimed at rights of the disabled around the world is 10% until 654, I haven't counted them recently, 64, 65, 4 million. And then there's Baron Morris, Privy Councillor, made that, made that way by Jim Callan, one of the very amazing appointments for such a young backbencher as he was before that. And then there's Alf, that his brilliant biographer, Derek Kinray, reminded us the other Alf, who haunted the halls of Westminster for 41 years. Alf the agitator. Alf the conciliator. Alf, somehow the same Alf Morris, who was a member of the Council of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. How did that come about? <laughs> and someone with the same name who was, for years, an advisor to the Police Federation and to the Royal British Legion and co-chairman of the Cooperative Society Parliamentary Group, a reformer of the law of copyright and a, a defender of war widows. And this is Alf Morris, the husband for 63 years to Irene. He must have slipped home sometimes because we have Kathy, Stephen and Paul and Jill. And the Irene is here, she here tonight? Well, I'd like to say hello to her, Irene. Hi, Irene. Last time we were, we were down together. And so, in just a short time, uh, the amazing, unparalleled renown that Half has enjoyed, and rightly so, in an area of public concern that will go on forever. Why? Why? Because tomorrow's accident victims don't know. But one day, unlucky, they may be persons of disablement. There but for the grace of God, go no, I should say the people who moan about disability benefits. Uh, one thing which is not very much known about Alf is how very important he was in the thalidomide uh, campaign when I was at the Sunday Times. And it's very good tonight to see we have some thalidomiders here. We have Martin Johnson, Ray Stokes, Nick Dobrik, Phil Williams, Tobias Arndt, Christopher Jeffries, Guy Tweedian, uh, Louise and Darren over here. And what's not much known about Alf is this. Uh, I went to see Jack Ashley, we'll come to Jack in a minute. I went to see the Prime Minister, uh, the leader of the opposition he was, he wasn't Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. And Alf had persuaded Harold Wilson to give up one of the only two days he had for a debate. And you couldn't resist Alf when he was in that kind of mood. So we got that debate, which transformed the entire discussion about thalidomide. Because until that time, Parliament and the press had been frightened, cowed by the law of contempt to say anything. And of course, it was Jack Ashley who lost his hearing in preparation for being a minister, who actually had persuaded the speaker to give this time. So Jack and Al for a wonderful partnership to, uh, to do that. Could I get a glass of water? Otherwise I might choke on my own words here. Um, I just want to rem remind you that until that happened, until Jack and Alf got together, whatever we'd done at the Sunday Times wouldn't have made much difference because the press was not touching it. There was complete silence everywhere else. And it was only the making Parliament, getting Parliament to discuss it, that we got the whole campaign uh, to move on the thalidomide at the front. And I'll just think of this. When you think of compensation for the thalidomide people, thalidomiders we call them, uh, just forget about financial benefits. 
and this is a lesson altogether about disarmament, think of what thalidomide has contributed. Out of the thalidomide tragedy came motability, blue carpets, direct result of, through the thalidomide, UK Thalidomide Trust, did that come about. And I thought it kind of ironic today uh, that Guy Tweedy was making a point uh, that when he comes to park a car at the usual garage, his arms are not long enough to get the ticket. And this is commonplace. The whole environment is not built for people who are not like me, with two arms, two legs, and not entirely brilliant hearing, uh, and so on. So I want to come to this point because what the important thing that Alf did, if you think about the progress of treatment and, and, and assistance and disability, we start with paternalism. When I began an interest in the thalidomide people, children, as they were then, it was a matter of charity. The Lady Hall Thalidomide Trust. Oh yes, paternalism, pity them. Pity. We begin with pity, which is completely wrong. And in fact, it was the atmosphere of pity, which he, Mr. Enoch Powell, uh, even he, he decried even that. I don't want to have an inquiry, I don't want to give them anything, they're on their own, and so on. It's one of the most disgraceful episodes. The Thurimite people were failed by the medical profession, they were failed by the legal profession, they were failed by the politicians, left, right and centre. They were failed by the House of Commons, by the House of Lords, and by the appeal, co the appeal courts. So, we just think about that. It's really kind of terrifying that so many institutions of state fail. And today, here's the remarkable thing. The fighters who've given, as I say, they've given more than they've been given. One of the wonderful, inspiring things at the moment is that the thalidomide victims, we have to say that, what are they doing? They're helping other thalidomiders around the world. At the moment, they're spending effort and time and money and intelligence to help establish the fact that the German trial of the original perpetrators of this was a crooked affair, was fixed politically. So we're looking back all these years at a terrible crime committed in Germany by the uh, manufacturers, Kevin Grunenthal, and then when it comes to justice, they don't get it. The trial is abandoned and the company is given immunity. It's absolutely incredible. But the important thing is that the revelation of that is coming from the work of thalidomide victims in the United, United Kingdom Thalidomide Trust. So if we look at the history of where we are with disablement, we go from a culture of paternalism, charity, pity, condescension, which goes a little way, it goes nowhere near where it should. And then we move, and that's what I call the kind of uh, paternalistic state. And then we move to the medical disability who define a medical term. And if you don't meet the actual medical definition, you don't get any help. And then it comes to a judge who has, may have some understanding, but may not, but he's restricted by language. And then we get the economic area of concern. People say, well, it costs so much. It costs so much. So we move from that, and it takes time around the world. And here in the United Kingdom, Alf Morris changes the entire world picture. Just think of that. Now, this is a boy, Alf Morris, who, mind you, he was a, a kid in short pants with me in Manchester. He was poorer than we were. We weren't really poor because my dad had a job. His dad, Alf Morris, Alf Morris's dad sat by the fire waiting to die. And when he did die, what did his widow get? No pension because he, he didn't die in combat. He just happened to have been gassed, lost the limb, and nothing was done for him. So we can see the, the roots of Alf's determination to do something. But that's one thing. 
but how brilliantly he did it. So that today, it's, it's a transformed situation. Now, I can go on for, let's say, three or four hours about what more needs to be done. Will you stick around? <laughs> I'll tell you. And it's not going wrong at the moment. But we have to bear in mind how far we've come, not only in actual things like getting a ramp for a real chair, getting mobility, getting proper allowances, and so on and so on, hearing aids and so on. But we've still got some way to go. But we always will. And the important thing is to recognize tonight what Alf did. I mean, uh, I can't... I was, we both grew up in the working class at the beginning of the war. And my father used to complain about the Geddes Acts. Now, I don't know how many people here have ever heard of Geddes. It was in the slums in the 1920s. Lord Inverchapel, his name was Geddes, Eric Geddes, he was a railway director. And he argued very strongly that the biggest mistake the government could make in the Depression was to let elementary school children go on to a secondary school because not only would it be a complete waste of money but it, they wouldn't understand half of what they were being taught that was the atmosphere in the night well of course Eric Geddes was right I mean what a terrible thing to have people like Alf Morris and me and my friends just causing a lot of trouble thereafter let us have suppressed them at their birth as possible and that's what, but of course you couldn't suppress Alf because even though he was not able to go to grammar school because of they couldn't afford the uniform, they couldn't afford this, they couldn't afford anything. So he left school at 14. They couldn't afford it. I left school at 15. That's not much better. And But he gets to Oxford and he gets a brilliant degree and so on. So just think, just think for a minute. We talk about the waste of talent, the waste of real abilities that we have when we don't educate people. And think about the waste of talent when we don't enable people who are disabled to give what they can give. The two are comparable. And that's why we have to do something about it. The waste of talent is in absolutely incredible. So we move from paternalism, legal judicial, to now what's I think commonly recognized and certainly are a very important part of this, but carried forward in the United States by regarding civil rights as the criteria. People who are disabled are, enti are entitled by right, not by paternalism, to have an environment in which they can move and give their talents and live their lives. And this is the most important thing which has happened at which Alf was the forerunner. It's not the wheelchair that's the disability, it's the stairs leading which is a disability because the environment's not being built. I was talking to Ken Alyssa, chairman of the Shaw Trust. He's just come back from Singapore. He's appalled at all the stairs everywhere. He asked them about it. Oh, we don't have anybody with wheelchairs here. Oh, what? Give me a break. That's the, that's the kind of... What, what the challenge today, which I saw so brilliantly ahead of time, is the environment should respond to the disablement. It's not the other way around. We, why should the world be designed simply for people with two legs, two arms, and the usual bits and pieces? Why? There's no reason for it at all. Let me give you an example. Uh, on Saturday, I was judging in European press prizes with a group of European editors. And a very distinguished one of them offered to give me a lift to Paddington. I regretted it because Paddington, if you've been, is a total mess. My God, it's incredible. You just round this street and that street and this street and up this street. Anyway, the point is this. When he came to park, he couldn't. Can you room? Why not? The London parking meters are designed for people with two hands. He had only one, and he was driving with one quite safely. Why was the parking meter designed that way? Why did, why did Guy Tweedy not able to reach to the ticket of the garage because his arm wasn't long enough? I mean, this, 
We're doing this today while I speak. We're designing and creating buildings which are not suitable for people who, have, who are differently able, you may say. And so this, I think, is quite the important thing, which again, Alf saw with such blinding clarity. And I got a letter while I was thinking of coming over here from Colin Bennett, who, who wrote me a passionate letter, why he wouldn't be here tonight. And if he is, I'm sorry, because he can't hear me. Why can't he hear me? Because his theatre, no fault of the theatre, is not equipped with an induction loop or infrared sound. So we have people who are denied access, just as you may be denied access when there's a flight of stairs and so on. So the social approach, the rights approach to disability is to remember when we're planners and thinkers and so on, just think of how other people interact with the community. And so this is what Alf, when Alf made his three points, to increase the welfare, improve the status, and en enhance the dignity of the chronically ill and disabled persons. He was delinking illness as a precondition to build a strong shared consciousness and political community. Now, ALF was very important too in the European Disability Forum, where again, from America, a restraint of the idea of rights rather than benefits. Rights rather than benefits. And the integration of displaced of accommodation in the, in the, in the deal, uh, in the community, changes, should change the way we organize and think about our society. Which Alpha, of course, again, in the Anti-Discrimination Act, which he wrote and stressed for in the United Kingdom. As he said, I'm not arguing for blind bus drivers or deaf piano tuners. And I don't pretend that all acts of discrimination can be ended overnight. But then he gave the examples. A young policeman, badly injured when tackling a gunman, is turned away from a charity event because he's in a wheelchair. A soldier who lost both legs at the Falklands War is banned from his local cinema because of a disability. A doctor who devotes much of her life is a guide to blind people. He's not allowed to enter Buckingham Palace to receive, receive the MBE. A disabled young man with a brilliant degree is told by his employer that because he is disabled, he is to be paid less than the other new employees for exactly the same work. Now, I've pointed out those things and pushed through these but just, just think how long it was that we tolerated that kind of discretion. And today, the, one of the most urgent things is what's going to happen to the living allowance for people with serious incapacity. You know, PITS is coming in. And the Disabled Living Foundation tells me that at the moment, only 40% of the applications after 16 months have been processed. And what have we got? with the Gloucester ruling, and what have we got with the attack now on closing the, the uh, what I call the, I don't know, ILF I call it, Independent Living Fund. And what have we got? It's going to close this year, 2015. And here's the great news. The local authorities are going to take it over. <laughs> what? I mean, got, what, the local authorities are going to step into the breach, what? I have news for you. The local authorities will do their best in many places not to step into the breach. And in fact, in this pocket of mine, I have a list of all the local authorities who have so far not responded to how they will pick up what is being passed on to them. Well, if I were running a newspaper today, and I'd like to suggest to anybody here who's in the media, what we should create is an index of shame. An index of shame in which the councils, the local authorities, which are doing something, thinking ahead. The councils which are still asleep, and the councils, few of them, which are presently active. And as local councillors here, I say this to you too, and we know what you're going to say, we haven't got the resources. So it's really kind of passing the buck. The government says, oh, we'll do this, we'll do it to the local authorities. But by the way, <laughs> you're on your own. Just what they said to the Thurdermiters. 
1969 and 1980, you're on your own. It's outrageous. And what's outrageous about it is the atmosphere in which these debates are conducted. There was a cartoon a year ago, I think. And a, a man is obviously a scrounger, okay, in his armchair with his house, his wife, and he says, this business is very bad. I think I'll have, I can't, I, can I get an allowance on the disabled living allowance? Joke. Not a joke. Underneath the caption was a new claimant every nine minutes, which happened to be false, by the way. It was in the Daily Mail. It happened to be false. <laughs> well, you have to believe what you read in print. <laughs> <laughs> my mother used to say, it was in print. I said, I know it's in print, Dad, but my dad says it's wrong. So the point is this, that it's really scandalous, the atmosphere in which these debates take place, considering what we've gone through. And the, I'll just give you an example of why it's so scandalous. But I took the trouble to look into the record of what's said in the Red Tops what's no doubt said in the election to come, the inference being, well, we all know that all these people are getting benefits for really scroungers, aren't they? Okay. You hear Mr. Farage talk, or some of these other people. And, but hear what, the, what uh, the UK Statistical Office, which is a very respectable and excellent service, has actually analysed some of the statements which have print, appeared in print in the Daily Mail, the Sun, in particular, I'm going to read you because it's very important. I don't think he, I, don't, I haven't seen much publicity about it, but this is what I want to, what they say, what the UK Statistical Office says. Some of the stuff you read about. Here it goes. This case after case where the figures have been distorted to make the disabled look worse. You know, that's what it says. I'll name one person, Grant Schatz, MP for the Conservative Party's chairman, was quoted as saying, nearly a million people have come off incapacity benefit before going for the test. This article was drawn from a Conservative Party press release which stated that 878,300 people claiming incapacity benefit, more than a third of the total, have chosen to drop their claim entirely rather than face a medical assessment. Yes, new figures have revealed. New figures have revealed no such thing. The United Kingdom Statistic Authority found that the 878,300 resulted from a conflation of official statistics relating to new ESA claims with separate statistics on migration of incapacity benefit claimants to ESA. The release also failed to make clear that a number of claims were withdrawn. Why? Because people got better, they're no longer sick, they didn't make a claim. I forgot about that. Oh yes, let's just exaggerate the number. Uh, so, and it, it's just amazing. So, then the UK Statistical looks at these things and they complain to the Department of Pensions and Works and say, can't you put out clearer pressure? Oh, don't blame us for such public hostility. We're only, you know, we have, well, yeah, it's all those terrible people out there. It's ridiculous. And, and here's what the, uh, the last thing which I've got. Uh, the UK, the Secretary of State's statement was unsupported, this is the UK Statistical Authority, was unsupported by the official statistics published by the department. It highlighted that the Job Centre plus activity statistics from which the figures were drawn appear to be drawn. Explicitly state that the figures are not intended to show what the minister suggested they intended. I mean, how can you get away with this? How can you get away with misstatements like this? Well, Fortunately, we have the UK Statistical Office, the Public Administrations Commission, and we have various official bodies that are pretty good. I'm not saying it's all entirely bad. Some of the reforms or changes are probably going to be good. But then some of them are presented in such a way that a, a media which is not inclined to be hospitable distorts it. And this is one thing I want to read. This is the UK Statistical Authority. The government is doing a great deal to promote a positive image of disabled people, true, including in the principles behind its disability strategy, 
and the Disability Confident Campaign to help disabled people into employment. Bravo. However, this positive action risks being undermined if the language used in Department of Pensions press releases and ministerial media comments accompanying releases of benefit adopts a tone which feeds into negative preoccupations and prejudices about people on benefits, including disabled people. That's as clear as a bell. They should be called to account. And what I'm going to suggest to people who are active in disablement is this, don't just take it lying down. I mean, obviously, you can challenge the politicians. I'm sure they've got some, they're doing some very good things. I'm sure some of the changes are, are important and helpful and not just uh, cost-conscious. But what, what should be done, what do you do when you read something which is clearly wrong, which has distorted the figures, what do you do? What do you do? You, don't, you shouldn't just sit there, <laughs> I say so. There's, after the hacking scandal, those of us who were concerned with the press and press matters agitated for an improved system of monitoring the performance of the press and enabling people to make proper representation, not just about having their phones hacked, not just about having their wives followed, not just having their children harassed at school by the obscenities that Lord Levinson condemned. We wanted to follow up with a proper and decent system of self-monitoring of the press, self-monitoring of the press, so that when we made mistakes or conducted false uh, campaigns which were wrong or whatever, that we could be called to account. And the, the, those who were in favor of this have formed two different, there's two different groups. There's one called Ipsos, which is the regular big papers, Telegraph and so on, uh, and then the others are standing aside at the moment are the Observer and the Guardian and the Independent. But Ipsos, which represents the main press, is there to deal with complaints. So the, the Linda Burfeld, who wrote Burnip, who wrote the excellent piece about the ILF, is having a campaign. You're going to stand outside the office of the Daily Mail. Good luck. So maybe they'll give you a coffee or something. Maybe they'll be a bit paternalistic. Who knows? But the important thing is, is there's Ipsos waiting to receive complaints. And if Ipsos doesn't respond, the case for the other monitors of the press will be stronger. So I just beseech people not to just take it, I don't want to say lying down, sitting up or whatever. Now, I think there's some very good things on the horizon, I have to say. First of all, you saw this morning's story about the Apple Watch, which will help you keep a check on your blood pressure. It'll be linked to your doctor, so you can scurry around with gin and tonic, whatever he thinks is needed at the time. It will all be done by radio. Uh, I'm very keen on this smart campaign which monitors your health and I think technology, whether it be loop coils for Mr. Bennett or different methods of uh, travel are going to be fantastically important, which is why it's also terrible that actually the percentage of people, disabled people and poor people have no access to the internet, which can be so liberating. For instance, now we can get one billion transistors on a chip. One billion transistors on a chip. Just it can do the most amazing things. So I think we're going to see a technical transformation in the lives of disabled people if they're enabled to have it. But at the end of all the acts, at the end of all the ramps and the disability and the benefits, at the end of all the, all the efforts by activists, by organizations, by good journalists. We still have the issue which my friend, one of my dear friends in the United States, put to me this way, and I want to read what she said to me. I said, what do you need? I expected to say, well, I'd like a faster wheelchair, or I'd like... This is what she said. I'm tired of people assuming I'm incompetent just because I'm in a wheelchair. Back in the 70s, they were surprised I was articulate and could speak. Today, 
people are still surprised. I live alone, take care of myself, drive a car, cook, work. I'm a lawyer and I travel. There's just this huge assumption that people make when they look at someone with a disability about their competency that goes beyond the actual disability. Or maybe it reflects their ignorance and their own fear they could, that they couldn't imagine coping with a disability. But for those of us who have disabilities, what we have to do to take care of ourselves is background noise. It doesn't stop us from wanting what everyone else wants. People are surprised that people with disabilities want romance and sex, like somehow we are different and beyond that basic need. No, no matter what our external shell looks like, we are still human. We all want to feel purposeful, contributory, and loved. We have dreams, we want adventure and independence, we want as full a life as we can get. And the whole point about this, that is your right to have. And so when we talk about disability, as I'm doing tonight, we also have to be careful about the language we use, which he drew my attention. There's a wonderful government in Western Cape in South Africa, which has talked about the language by, by which we have these dialogues. He says, don't say somebody suffers from. It suggests they have ongoing pain. And that's no more true of disabled people than able-bodied people. Don't say somebody is afflicted with. It suggests a disease which most disabled people don't actually have. Don't say a victim of, as I said earlier, I'm getting standing corrected here, because it's reminiscent of crime. Don't say wheelchair bound, because it sounds as though the disabled person is in prison for life. You don't say car bound, because somebody's got somewhere by a car. Don't confine and don't diminish people by these terms. Don't use patients unless in a hospital. This is the Western Cape. And don't define people. He's a diabetic. Don't define people by their disability. Don't define it. And don't, by the way, don't say he may be physically or mentally challenged. Aren't we all? <laughs> Give me a break. Harry Evans is mentally challenged. Sure, I was. Absolutely am. Quite agree. So, and don't, obviously, nobody, I don't, I don't think anybody says crippled or crippled today. And if nobody, I hope, says a, 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 an abnormal birth defect. I was thinking one of the leaders I had lunch with today, Phil, when he went to school, by the way, he's a brilliant accountant now, but he's got, you know, his arms are not like mine. But when, he's got a brain better than I have because he's a brilliant accountant. But when he went to school, do you know what the heading of the school was? Subnormal edu educational facility. Subnormal education. This guy is quite brilliant. But that's the kind of thing we have to get rid of in our language. And I want to say this, close this with this, these remarks. First of all, I want to remind us what Alf himself said. I would choose a society, if I had a wish, in which there is a genuine compassion for the very sick and the disabled, where understanding is unostentatious and sincere, where needs become before means, where if you this cannot be added to the lives of the chronically sick, at least life can be added to their years, where the mobility of disabled people is restricted only by the bounds of technical progress and discovery, and where no person has cause to be ill at ease because of their disability. Forty years ago, and we have to thank Al for making the start that he did, but I also want to just read you something which actually puts it in, in, in perspective for me. The whole earth, that Pericles said, is the sepulchre of famous men. And their deeds are, long after they're gone, are woven into the stuff of other men's lives. And so it is with Alf. So it is with Alf. And so one who congratulates the, the family for supporting Alf through those years and remember him with gratitude and affection. Thank you.
much. So eloquent for a man who was still scribbling away when I went into the uh, green room about an hour ago. Um, I'm sure that there are a number of questions here, but I just wanted to pick up on your use of language. Oh, yes. Because there has been a discussion going on about, um, about the way in the disability um, cuts have been made, welfare cuts, and so on, and how that plays into how you fight back. I was interested, and I wanted you to expand, if you could, on that use of that, how, the, how people can stop, get, can challenge the media. Well, I think, you know, it begins, uh, it begins in daily intercourse, because when somebody, let's just take, let, with media is one thing, and then it's our daily exchanges with people. So when we hear somebody making some derogatory remark, or we well, you know about him, he's always on the scrounge, or whatever, I think, I don't think we should let it go by. I don't think we should let it go by. I think we should challenge it. In the media, first of all, a challenge on accuracy is better than an emotional challenge. So when the, uh, the different activists, some of whom I've mentioned tonight, challenge what the papers say, what the print says, which is then, as you know very well, being a journalist yourself, the print very often sets the agenda. Uh, so the agenda and the coloration, the terms in which the debate, so people get scared. I don't want to go against, you know, the impression you get from some of the answers to those misstatements was, well, you know, the public's very concerned about benefits. Sure, we all, I don't want to pay any extra tax. It's natural. At the same time, I want truth in our, in our public life, and I want some decency in the conduct of our public affairs. So, first of all, of course, we should support, you know, uh, vocally when we see something appalling. Secondly, we should vote for the right candidate <laughs> and test them and test them and see what kind of bromides they come out with. Uh, are there any questions? There are some people around uh, the, um, put your hands up high. Yes, I can see one gentleman here. Uh, sorry, there's one yeah. Uh, thank you. My name's Bruce Key. I'm medical director for the NHS in England. Can, when, when I have some difficult issues, I sometimes find myself going back and asking the question, what would Bevan do now? And so when I've listened to your talk, I'd just like you to reflect on perhaps if Alf could come back for a year, what would he do now? That's a good question. That's a good question. Well, I think he'd, first of all, I think he'd be making speech after speech about the end of the ILF without there being independent living, without there being, pro he would certainly would do that. And he would have a motion in the House, he would get a lot of MPs to sign it. Oh, sorry, what, what's the matter? I'm sorry, Bob, I was just trying to be efficient. Oh, you're trying to make, you, you want me to be heard? Okay, right. I think he would do that. But I also think since he was a far-sighted man, I think he would be meeting with Apple, and other people, and saying, what can we now do technically? Because we've got these billion transistors on this chip. What the hell are we going to do with it for the benefit of people who have problems? And I think this, I, I, I'm not clever enough to predict what the changes could be. But, if, but it's, very, it's magic at the moment. For instance, you probably do this, it may or may not do this. But I, when I'm traveling, I can change the temperature in my house. Any room I want, I can also, but I don't use this a great deal because it might be embarrassing. I can also look into every single room when I, through, my, through my cell phone. I've never found anything embarrassing, I must tell you. And, and, and so those, those are just tiny things. And in, in the, my friend next door in the country, when he goes, he, doesn't, he never touches anything. He doesn't need a hand. Everything responds to his bodily presence. The lights go on, the waters come on, the garage door opens, everything. The vast potential of the billion transistors is fantastic. And I think Al, Alf would be meeting with people like that. I also think, by the way, he'd have other concerns. He'd be concerned about global warming and so on. But I think those are the things. Now, you, this audience could probably tell me what he ought to be doing. Because I'm not as aware as I ought to be, perhaps, of some of the deficiencies in things. Maybe you want wheelchairs which are faster, 
soup up. Maybe you want the Chichi Chichi Bang wheelchair, which can jump over hedges, whatever. I don't know. This shows the paucity of my imagination. Well, I was going to say that they are one well, cyclic due on the stage tomorrow. Really? <laughs> so that, by the way, one thing, the one thing I should have mentioned was one of the inspiring things, of course, since Alf did that, was the Paralympics. I mean, it was marvellous, that was, I thought, in London, to come out and see all this. What can be overcome, you know? Oh, hi there. Yeah, thank you very, very much. I'm Tom Jenison. I'm the editor of Able magazine. Um, thanks to people like uh, Alf Morris, disability issues have become far more visible. I'd like to ask how you think we ought to guard against the dangers of complacency amongst people in society. You think we've done enough for disabled people? Yes. There may be. I thought you, there may be. I'll tell you one thing which I didn't mention, which I should have done, is that MENCAP is also something worth noting. That impatience with people who are slow to learn and so on, and the education system. In the United States, I mean, for instance, to give you an idea, this may not be the entirely right answer. When my daughter, uh, Kate, was going to school in Brookfield, in London, I wouldn't worry about that. I don't think, I mean, you, do, you, you don't want me to say, and I'm not going to say it, it makes us more sympathetic because I'm arguing against that. It's the rights. My main point, really, basically, is it's a right, not, not simply a benefit. So I, I wouldn't be concerned. I think it's lovely to see more people get around, like my friend here, and like Darren and Louise here. It's great. And I'm pleased to see you. I mean, I'd be sorry not to see you. Uh, but I was just talking about MENCAP because that's another very important area which neglected. My daughter Kate, I would say, when she was at school in Highgate, she was dyslexic. And what was it? She couldn't, she had the letters jumbled. She was made to stand on a table and say, this is the worst girl in the school. She doesn't know how to spell. But she was dyslexic. It's like saying, well, why aren't you running a mile when you haven't got, you've only, you've only got one leg? I mean, the, the um, amount of awareness now, uh, just to come back to the point of what disability and what physical handicaps are there and what mental handicap is a good thing. It's, we should be aware of it. We should know what the limitations are, but we shouldn't then treat people as though that's, that's all they are. We shouldn't define people by their disability. I think we've got time for just one more. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Paul Dinsdale. A health, I'm a health journalist. Um, I just wondered, having uh, just like to ask how, having lived in the U.S. for many years, um, are there any lessons that the U.S. have to teach the U.K. in terms of disability um, and li living with disability, or are, are the lessons mostly the other way that the U.K. is a better model? Um, with the legislation that Alf Morris has introduced, uh, are there any lessons that way? I think that's an interesting question. You know, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, not George Bush who took us to Iraq, but his father, uh, George Bush Sr., who brought through the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, which is uh, approaching disability on the basis of rights, said this is important as bringing down the Berlin Wall. And in a curious way, uh, that has raised consciousness a great deal. You know, the United States is very conscious of gender differences, color, uh, pigment of skill, pigment of skin, and also disabilities. And there's actually, I think, I don't, I've, I wouldn't know whether this is true or not, but I'm very conscious of the fact that in the United States, the consciousness of rights is so strong that when there's discrimination against the black, against the lesbian, against the gay, there's a, there's a reaction. Mind you, of course, there's a vast amount of right-wing reactionary stuff in the United States too, but the rights movement has grown enormously strong, and I think it may, in that respect, in terms of atmosphere, be slightly ahead of the United Kingdom. I don't know, I've not lived here long enough to sense it. I mean, I lived here for 30 years. I mean, lived here back, back again. Uh, the, the emphasis on rights is very important. And also, because people are always enamored of enterprise and technology, 
in the States, more so even than the United Kingdom. There's a lot and lot of business enterprises making specific use of disabled people. I think now Alf would be fully aware of all these things. Um, I don't want to paint a, 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 one thing which I think I can say with some conviction actually that apart from one or two instances the press is more respectful than some of the press here which is, tends to make disabled people objects of derision. Most of the people say the American newspapers are boring. Yeah, but they're boring if you like, but they're also respectful generally. And I hate the fact that sometimes these attitudes in the British press are so hostile and so mean-spirited. Much enjoyed your, um, your your talk. My name is Michael McGrath, I'm the chief executive of a national family charity called the Muscle Health Foundation. I have a question, two, part, two parts of the question. Part one is my future son-in-law is a news editor for a well-respected um, magazine. And I'm sure he'd be delighted to talk to you about the list in your pocket. What was that? About the what, sorry? The list in Sir Harold's pocket. The list in your pocket. Oh, the list. Oh, yes, here it is. <laughs> got, you know, here it is. You know, this is the list of this is the list of the local authorities who have not done well. Okay, and I, 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 I've got it on my computer, so I can follow up. That's what I think about that. Thank you. My second part of my question is: um, um, I'm sure that many people here this evening have a critical friend. I do. And many years ago, that critical friend said to me, Michael, you're an inconvenient truth. How would you respond to that question? Or perhaps how would Alf respond to the question? An inconvenient truth. An inconvenient friend. Yes, how would you respond? An inconvenient truth. truth. How would you respond to that truth? If, if he was described as an inconvenient friend. Truth. Oh. <laughs> An inconvenient truth. truth. An inconvenient truth. Oh my God. <laughs> we got there. Well, whoever said it, you know, is kind of ridiculous. What can I say? I'm just trying to. Th I got confused with a book called A Convenient Hatred, which is about anti Semitism, and an inconvenient, you know, Al Gore's global warming. I was trying to think of a suitable epi epithet for that character. Uh, uh, well, why don't you call him a basically convenient liar? I mean, what else can I say? It's, I, it, I think we're on that note, uh, and we can discuss it further. But um, can I just say thank you very much to you? Before I thank Sir Harry, before you leave, can I remind you that the purpose of the evening is to raise funds for the Alf Morris Fund and Living? So around there for your donations and please pass them to members of the staff as you are going through the doors. Thank you so much for coming but particularly can I thank Sir Harry for that just fantastic, marvellous first ever speech for this. For this. I know you didn't want to call it a lecture. No, I didn't know. Well, I hope it's not the last. No, and it was, <laughs> it was beautifully delivered and raised an awful number of issues. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.